What kind of a church has a war banner hanging in the front of its sanctuary? What kind of church sings the Psalms of the Bible exclusively, without musical accompaniment, just like it did when it was founded two centuries ago? What kind of church founds its ministry unapologetically on the Word of God and maintains its theological commitments undiluted over many generations? What kind of church unashamedly proclaims the Lordship of Jesus Christ over men and nations in the face of mounting pressure to compromise? The Bloomington Reformed Presbyterian Church in Bloomington, Indiana is indeed a unique congregation and in the fall of 2021, she is celebrating her 200th year of ministry in Southern Indiana. We hope you will join us in giving thanks to God who has maintained and used this congregation of his church over these many years. The Bethesda Congregation of the Reformed Presbyterian Church was officially organized on October 10, 1821 in Bloomington. The congregation began with just eight members who had migrated to Bloomington from Chester County, South Carolina. There was a large community of Scots-Irish Covenanters, as the Reformed Presbyterians were called, who had come to South Carolina from Northern Ireland in the latter half of the 18th century. These Presbyterian immigrants came to America in search of economic opportunity and land. They established several congregations in the Rocky Creek area of Chester County in the north central part of South Carolina, where growing cotton and producing textiles were the major industries. The Reformed Presbyterian Church, with congregations in Pennsylvania, New York, and South Carolina, was formally organized in 1774. As a largely immigrant church, they brought with them a fiercely independent streak, as well as a commitment to the weak and marginalized. As early as 1800, the church had officially barred from membership any slaveholder, believing that American slavery was contrary to God's law and an abomination in his sight. This strong anti-slavery stance made life in South Carolina particularly difficult. For this reason, in addition to economic concerns, most of the Reformed Presbyterians around Chester County began migrating north, eventually planting churches and farming communities in southern Ohio, Indiana, and Illinois during the early decades of the 19th century. I'm James Ferris, pastor of Second Reformed Presbyterian Church in Indianapolis, and uh, one of my own ancestors, James Ferris, was one of those who was in that second generation of people there in the upcountry of South Carolina. Uh, the question is sometimes asked, uh, why would the Covenanters in the 1820s have given up all that they had in South Carolina to come west, as they called it. We would typically think of it being north, but they referred to it as being west to Indiana uh, in order to start fresh. And it's a really good question. In the 1820s, Indiana was the frontier of the whole nation. The War of 1812 had uh, come to its conclusion, and the question uh, remain, would the United States continue to expand westward? And Indiana was the first state to be added to the Union after the War of 1812 as that positive statement that, yep, we're going to go forward as a nation. And so Indiana began to be settled, especially from the South, as people came from places like South Carolina, from Tennessee, and from Kentucky. And it was pretty tough sledding for those settlers who came. Uh, Indiana was largely a swampland and forest and it was uh, difficult to eke out a living. And uh, one of my own ancestors, James Ferris, was one of those who was in that second generation of people there in the upcountry of South Carolina. And uh, he was a part of a movement that began to really uh, question slavery and to stand against it. And so the principal reason why the Covenanters left South Carolina was especially over slavery. And James Ferris himself had been principal of the academy uh, for boys in Pendleton, South Carolina. And they had tried to uh, work with a number of legislators and others to at least see uh, South Carolina open to 
uh, people setting their slaves free. But when not even that would work, they finally decided that the influences on their family were just going to be too significant and too overwhelming, and so they decided to make the journey uh, to Bloomington. One group of these covenanters settled just outside of Bloomington, where the new state seminary, now Indiana University, had opened in 1820. And so one of the things that we see in this as part of the legacy of the Covenanters is not only that they were willing, in this case, to take a stand against something like man-stealing and slavery and uh, all of the evils uh, attached to that culture, uh, we also see an intense interest that was really forward-looking. They wanted to be part of education. They wanted to be part of development. They wanted to be part of the uh, next generation of, of seeing what the Lord would do in this new culture. The congregation met in homes and public buildings for a few years, calling its first pastor, James Ferris, in 1827. He came to Bloomington, hoping to teach at the seminary to supplement his meager pastoral salary, but ended up farming instead. During the whole time he served as pastor, 1827 to 1855, he never earned more than $180 a year in salary from the church. He guided the church through a major split in 1833 and then into its own building in 1836. He was an effective pastor and community member and raised eight children. Four of his sons grew up to be Reformed Presbyterian ministers. The first church building was located about two miles southeast of town at what is today the intersection of Hillside Drive and High Street. In 1839, Thomas Smith deeded the land on that corner for what is known as the Covenanter Cemetery. The original church building sat just to the north of the cemetery. Smith, one of the elders of the congregation, as well as Pastor Ferris and others in the church, were actively involved in helping escaped slaves travel north on the Underground Railroad. The Smith and Ferris houses are still in use today as single-family homes near the site of the original church building. The congregation officially changed its name from Bethesda to the Bloomington Congregation of the Reformed Presbyterian Church in 1876. A year later, they moved into a new building just a few blocks south of the downtown area near the corner of Walnut Street and 3rd Street. The church sold the land where the first building was located for $25 to a former slave they had helped named Robert Anderson. Descendants of Mr. Anderson still live at that location to this day. The Covenanter Cemetery Association continues to oversee the cemetery where many significant figures in Bloomington history are buried. The congregation remained near downtown Bloomington until 1927, when they erected a new building on what was then the southern edge of town at the corner of First Street and Lincoln Street. The church has continued to worship at this location since that time. The current building was designed by Harry E. Boyle and Company from Evansville, Indiana, and is considered an outstanding example of the Greek Revival architecture that was popular in the early 1900s. Its 25-foot-high ceilings make the sanctuary an ideal setting for the a cappella singing that is characteristic of Reformed Presbyterians. The congregation in Bloomington really has an illustrious history, and it's a beautiful thing. But the thing that is most exciting of all, the greatest legacy, is to see the people who are living today that are loving the Lord Jesus Christ and loving one another and loving their neighbors. <laughs> My name's Lawrence. I'm Wilma Jean. Curry. Because I was the first one to be baptized in this church. So that'd be 94 years ago. My father was always a farmer. I grew up on a farm. My father was a deacon here. My grandfather was an elder. My mother always told me that I, uh, put some pennies under the cornerstone out here. If they ever tore this church down, well, I, I'd get those pennies out. <laughs> Joe Moore. I was born and raised 
uh, in this church. Uh, my mom had me baptized. My father wasn't a believer. And my mom had me baptized, and so I've been going to church here ever since then, which has been a little over 80 years. Uh, I had a little problem when I got to be about oh, around uh, 18 years old. I saw all the fun uh, people was having and enjoying themselves, and uh, I wanted to join in with that. And so for the next 20 years, um, I, uh, that's what I did. It was a time of fun. Uh, but it was uh, it was terrible. Uh, it wound up in uh, uh, divorce, uh, alcoholism, uh, bankruptcy, um, all the things that you're warned not to do. I guess I had tried all out, and so I did. Probably the, maybe the biggest thing was I took a job uh, that I worked on for 18 years, which was working on Sunday. And that was the downfall, I believe, of, uh, of the whole thing. Away from God's Word, how can you be fed? Uh, he allowed me all the way down in every way. And then He picked me all the way back up. I couldn't stay away from the church anymore. Uh, and so I was determined to get back. But I never read a book in school. I was proud of that. And they wouldn't tell me to read that book. I went on without it. So uh, I fell in love with his word. I've had cancer and I've had different strokes. And he's taken me through all of that. Those strokes are hard. <laughs> so I just told somebody that transferred here to another church. And I said, what you see is what you get. And basically, that's it. Uh, so no entertainments and all that stuff, attractions. Um, it's just a plain, plain preaching, I believe. Don and Ellen Moore. He, one of the questions was, when do you don't remember being here? And I, <laughs> no memory. I was over here all my life. Our, our wedding anniversaries, August 26th, we'll be married 53 years, right? 54. Them 54? Yeah. Men and their memories. We started dating uh, in 67 or 67. 66. And uh, we actually went to a Ramsey Lewis concert out of IU, and the next day was our first date here. And that was... So our second date was here in this church. Yeah. <laughs> we had known each other... I had a friend that lived down on the road across, lived across the street from a free Methodist church, and she just happened to be walking through there, lived a couple blocks over, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, just happened to see her. And, you know, I didn't know anything very much about cars or girls or anything. <laughs> and uh, it something just stuck. One day we uh, met and been going on ever since. We actually met at the bowling alley. One of his friends says, Ellen, why don't you go out with Donnie? I said, oh, what kind of car does he have? <laughs> what kind of car? <laughs> it was a 65 Oldsmobile, one of those little four-speed 442 things. It's beautiful. But that's one thing that I've felt ever since I started here, the love and acceptance. I did not come from a Christian background, and, uh, and yet I was accepted. Another strength that I see, too, is just that the, like Donnie says, the stability of it. We know what to expect from Rich and from Philip, how they do. We know how our session works. We have a wonderful, wonderful session. Uh, and they tell us, we pray for you. We pray for the congregation during our session meetings. To me, that's a real strength. Prayer is a real strength. There's no getting around about that, so. Hi, my name's Pam Arthur. I've, I've been in this church all my life. Well, as a child, uh, I remember uh, being in the church service, um, squirming around, and my mom trying to keep me quiet. And I loved the singing, you know, as a child. I remember the people. They were very supportive and loving of the young people. And uh, I remember the Sabbath school, the classes, my teachers. You know, I had really sweet teachers and ones that, you know, took an interest in your life and we did things together and they took us places and, and um, 
let's see, I remember the the pastors that we, when I was young, it was uh, uh, Roy Blackwood uh, when I was little. And then um, later it was, you know, the other pastors, but that was the first pastor I remember. Hi, uh, my name is Lena Dixon. We had a, a moderately sized youth group and then um, the older kids didn't want to be with the younger kids anymore. The high school kids wanted away from the junior high. So uh, we split into two different groups. And uh, the one group was called, the, the older kids group was called the ACT Teens, Action for Teens in Christ. And the younger group was the Vic Teens, Victory in Christ. And uh, so we had different leaders and different schedules and things. But uh, um, usually we met on Sunday evenings before the, um, the evening service. We had a lot of um, senior saints when I was growing up, but they were very godly people. And they really understood life, uh, were there to be, be an encouragement to you. And we had fun with them. We had all kinds of social parties and, and different th socials and different things. Um, but we would hear them pray for us. And uh, I think that that really, that meant a lot to me main thing that stands out out to me is stability. The Word of God is central. Jesus Christ is central. And I think that's the important thing. Hi, uh, our names are Wes and Angie Archer. It's been close to about 20 years at the church. Um, I started coming here prior to Angie coming and such, but we were able to meet at the church, which was quite a blessing. So I came out for school and um, actually met the Holdemans uh, the first week I was here. I did not grow up in the church, and so um, I was really drawn to their family and their love uh, for the people in the congregation. Uh, and just the, the preaching of the word was what I was looking for coming to the church. Mm -hmm. So I came and actually met Wes the first week and then started coming back and um, and we were, I think, engaged within the year maybe, mm -hmm. so. <laughs> Say the friendliness of the folks, mm -hmm. the love they have for the people of the congregation. Um, I know it was one thing that we were talking about mm -hmm. earlier that really was um, a huge blessing to experience and, um, and then continue. We also just the faithfulness of the preaching, mm. just knowing that you're going to hear truth and um, knowing that our kids are in the worship with us and growing and um, learning just alongside everyone else. And I would say too, just yeah, week by week with that, um, the faithfulness of uh, each sermon uh, pointing to um, mm -hmm. Jesus Christ and just knowing that week by week you're built up in the faith. And I, and I think as well, just the love that the congregation has for the kids of the congregation and investing in mm -hmm. um, Sabbath school program, BBS, uh, the youth group mm -hmm. is, is huge. Uh, I know each of our kiddos have been quite glad when they turn 12 years of age mm -hmm. uh, to be able to join the, the ranks of the youth group and, and really seeing that thrive um, under the folks leading that and such. That's been a blessing. Hi, my name is Carrie Knighty. I've been a member of this congregation since 1972. I teach Sunday school, so um, I love the little bitty ones. Um, so I, I have two and a half to four, really teaching them those stories and watching them get excited. Uh, the kids just love the, those early stories. Um, I've been um, on the nursery committee um, early on and uh, served for a little while. Um, that that was always a you know something that's very necessary. <laughs> Somebody needs to watch the children. <laughs> um, but the hospitality committee, I've never been a part of that, and the fellowship committee, I feel like that that is one of our really great outreaches. You know, once you get people into uh, the congregation, the you know, those ladies go and they, they go after it. And, you know, there's meals and for students, for young adults. Over the years, I've always felt very supported by our pastors. Um, our pastors, they'll reach out, you know, um, they do like a prayer, they pray for Pray for like three or four families every Sunday. So just before that, if, if you're if your if your number's up, then you uh, you get a call or an email from the pastor saying, you know what what can we pray for you? And that really is encouraging for me to be able to you know to know that you know you know your church family is praying for you. 
My name is Ken DeYoung, and this is my wife, Carolyn, and uh, my son, Josh, happened to be around, and so we, we brought him along today. Uh, so we've been, uh, in, been here since 1994. Uh, 1994, my wife and I um, relocated down here to work at the university. Uh, we kind of bounced around the country to, from place to place. And our background is in the Dutch Reformed Church, and so we're, we're kind of, of a slightly different flavor of reform. Um, and, but when we came down here, we, we met um, uh, we, we met somebody who was a friend of my father's, and that was Bill Roberts. When we came here, there was maybe 60, 65 people that were worshiping mm -hmm. here, um, which is way different than it is now. Mm -hmm. um, it was very small, mostly local people. Uh, there was a mixture of people, not a lot of people in our age group. I think they had basically two or three high schoolers, so we joke about they're not being high schoolers. That wasn't really too much of a joke. When we first moved here, we thought it was only for a year. Yeah. So we had no knowledge that we would still be here to yeah. this day. So the typical worship service in the 1990s is virtually identical to the typical worship service uh, last week, um, really. Uh, it really is. I mean, the, 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 the Psalters changed colors and uh, so some, you know, but basically it's, it's virtually identical. But there's a lot of stuff uh, surrounding the worship that, that did change because I remember those first years, the lighting in the sanctuary was really bad. And, and the sound system, oh my. They had two systems that were in, in sequence. So there was a time lag between the speakers in the back of the sanctuary and the speakers in the front of the sanctuary. So it was interesting because one of the first things they did when they started thinking about you know capital improvements and that sort of things, the first things they did was lighting and sound systems. And uh, man, and the sanctuary is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. yeah. At that time, you weren't so sure about that. <laughs> when we first came, the um, evening service was so small that we met here oh, in, in the ballroom. Room. Um, for the evening service. And I remember when we started getting more and more people and suddenly we couldn't fit in the more room. That was such a joyous occasion, you know. <laughs> we get to move to the sanctuary for the evening <laughs> service, you know. <laughs> it, was, yeah. it was great. Um, this congregation has always been a praying congregation. And I don't know previous to our coming here, but definitely since we've come here, uh, that's one thing that we notice, that people are really sincere about praying for the church, praying for the future, um, praying for new members, um, really hospitable to new people. Um, and they prayed very, very diligently that the Lord would grow us again, even after seeing a decline. Just that pure preaching of the word and that prayer and um, you know, really, really desiring to do what the Lord would have us do. And, and He's kept this church going. It's, it's really, it's Him. The church has continued to serve the Bloomington community from this location, having a membership of nearly 200 people in 2021. Over its history, the congregation has been served by 21 different pastors, eight of whom are alive today. When former pastor Roy Blackwood left the congregation in 1961, Bloomington was the only Reformed Presbyterian church in the state of Indiana. Today, there are 11 churches, including the Terre Haute Reformed Presbyterian Church, which was planted directly by the Bloomington congregation. Significantly, the congregation went through a transformation beginning in the early 1990s, when the church's weekly attendance had dropped into the 50s. With a substantial commitment to prayer, evangelism, and outreach ministry, the Lord brought about the revitalization of the congregation. Uh, what we've seen is a total spiritual revolution in that congregation. And um, it was because of the Holy Spirit working through people. And reflecting back on it, I think that is important to realize is the degree to which strong leadership is an essential part of a congregation's life, whether it be spiritual or physical or otherwise. I uh, came to Bloomington as a student at IU, and one of the reasons I came to IU was because of the church. And uh, I find this not atypical because there have been a number of people that have been drawn to the university because of the church. And I just joined the crowd and came there in 1963. One of the pastors, associate pastors that we had there, 
over the years uh, commented in his terminal exit interview how he had been advised not to go to Bloomington because it was like uh, going into a, a place where, they, as he said, they would eat you up, meaning the pastors didn't stay for very long. I really think that there was very little attention to the personal welfare of the pastor. Uh, that, that may seem unfair, but I really think that's what was going on. And that has changed dramatically over the years, dramatically. So that now the pastors are, I think, cared for very well. When we came to Bloomington, uh, the congregation, I, I can't recall, I don't recall what the uh, membership number was, but I can recall the fact that uh, the mean age was probably around 60, 65. And uh, I remember our, our own children were some of the very few children that were there. The pastor had some kids and uh, we did. And the spiritual life was uh, modest at best. We tended to be more inverted. Yeah. You know, we stuck to ourselves. Pam and Martha used to say when we went to church camp that we were kind of clicky because we still <laughs> sat with our own group, you know, and that sort of thing. But I think in, in, in recent years, in the last 25 years, people are much more comfortable with discipleship, I think. Uh, I think we have the ladies are comfortable doing Bible studies. Of course, we used to have Phoebe's a long time ago and the ladies would gather. But, um, and I think there's just the, not only the, the physical, the, the numbers, the numerical, but the spirituality I think is, is better, at least for me. I just have to say for myself that um, there's just more roots there now. When Bill Roberts arrived, it became very clear through his quiet, thoughtful leadership that he was a visionary. I'm not a visionary. And I, I like to say Bill could see around corners. Uh, he, saw the, he saw a future. Uh, he wouldn't say that about himself, but uh, it was very clear. And he saw a future for the congregation I think many of us didn't see. In an effort to help the congregation um, see its own shortcomings, if you will, as well as assets, um, we did a lot of planning. We did a lot of uh, evaluating where we are now, where we believe God wants us to be. I can remember making visuals back in the days of overhead projector, putting them on the screen, putting them in front of the congregation. And uh, I remember the reactions, specific reactions of several people there at that time, recognizing the fact that um, this is a congregation that's dying. I mean, the congregation shortly before we were here was, um, I mean, they had been declining and declining and declining since, uh, you know, since Roy Blackwood was here. And um, they had a meeting uh, where they, they just sort of plotted all the membership and they, well, they watched the internet, you know, you just plot a line through it and eventually you get to zero. So zero is when there's nobody here anymore. And I forget what the year was, but it was, you know, it was a long time ago that it should have been at zero. and so. Uh, I remember then it was Ruth Dixon, I think, was the person who sat up and said, well, we just got to do something. <laughs> they had congregational meetings and trying to, you know, think things through and what we were going to do. And, you know, they started making plans as to what to do and had a, a re, kind of revitalization project. I think the, the goal was to get another pastor at some point, you know, a second pastor. And we were all trying to give above and beyond what we normally gave. You know, this is not natural for Scotsmen to, to think about spending money and, you know, spending all your budget, right? Basically saying we're going to wipe out our budget in the next three years to just try to you know, encourage growth in the congregation. So they brought Andy on and, um, yeah, within the way the Lord would have it, within three, four years, uh, there was a cohort and uh, the, person, the cohort started having these, these kids and, uh, and things changed pretty, pretty rapidly. Andy McCracken was our uh, associate pastor at that time, and um, I think they they did a great team building as far as you know getting that outreach out there, and and our numbers have grown you know quite a bit over the years. Bill was able to focus on on, on the the visionary part of it, and I think I came kind of behind and helped put together the uh, planning and organization that might uh, help uh, bring those objectives into reality. That, you know, I, I didn't consider myself a preacher. Um, 
that, that wasn't my role. Uh, you know, the scripture talks about different gifts, and I guess mine was organization, administration, and that sort of thing. So often we think of growth in numbers. Um, we need more people. We need a congregation that's larger and so on. But I think if the emphasis is on the spiritual life, that the focus is where it should be. And so this, this is, I think, the, the biggest change that has taken place over there in the years that I've been involved. The current worship attendance is triple what it was when the revitalization efforts began. One of the initiatives of this program was the calling of a second pastor to aid in the work. It was an unusual move in those days, but it bore significant fruit. The congregation has remained committed to the concept of team ministry and has benefited tremendously from having multiple pastors serving together since that time. Hello, my name is Philip McCollum, and I'm one of the pastors here. I serve alongside Pastor Rich Holdeman, and I've been here three years. I came originally from Belfast in Northern Ireland, and um, the church here called me to be their second pastor back in 2018. And um, so I moved here uh, with my wife and four children, um, soon settled into life in Bloomington, the community, and then also here in the church. Yeah, so Bloomington has two pastors, so I work alongside Pastor Rich Holdeman, and that's been um, a huge help in that uh, two men working together, um, supporting one another, encouraging one another, and, and then just sharing the workload um, is a blessing. So normally Rich preaches in the morning, I preach in the evening, and um, as a team ministry, it's worked well together. Yeah, the church has grown in the last three years since I've been here. As a church, I think it's a unique church in this community because it's a church that loves God's Word. And, uh, and that's evident by the fact that we have an evening service, which is well attended. Normally when there's an evening service, it's pretty sparse, um, but people come back and um, they want to hear God's Word. And both the morning and evening services have grown and um, we've been encouraged by um, new people coming and I think a lot of that is to do with the, the seriousness of um, that people take in regards to learning from God's Word and, and um, others join in and see that and, and they want that too and so very quickly they get into the habit of coming both to the morning and to the evening service. So that's been um, a way of seeing, seeing growth in the congregation. Hello, my name is Rich Holdeman, and it's been my pleasure to be a part of this congregation for nearly 30 years since I moved to town. First, I was a member of the congregation and then served for 11 years as a ruling elder, and then I became one of the pastors here in 2005 and have been serving in that capacity ever since. One of the things my wife and I noticed when we moved to town in 1992 was how loving this congregation was. The people loved not only God and His Word, but loved one another. And at that time, the church had been through a period of decline and was just committing itself to a period of revitalization. They called a second pastor in Andy McCracken to come, and they had committed a lot of resources, prayer, and effort into revitalizing the congregation. So we were blessed to be here during a time in which the congregation has tripled in size. Psalm 127 tells us that unless the Lord builds the house, is the builders build in vain. And it's certainly been the case that the Lord has provided some tremendous builders over the years, and we're very grateful for their labors. At the same time, it's also very clear that the Lord Himself has been at work in revitalizing this congregation and sustaining it and in using it for His glory. Yes, so this past year with the pandemic uh, certainly did bring changes um, to the church here, uh, like for all churches, and live streaming was a new thing for us. It wasn't something that we had even considered beforehand, <laughs> and, um, and now the services are live streamed uh, both morning and evening, and uh, initially that was how the congregation uh, met, was online. Uh, for a number of weeks and then very quickly we got services back in person again uh, but the live streaming has continued and it has been interesting that people now check us out on the live stream uh, before they come to our church and so when they do come to our church they already know us and um, 
and they, you know, you walk up to them to introduce yourself and you can tell they already seem to know who I am and other people in the congregation, they very quickly settle. You can tell that they already have decided we want to be part of this church. I think during the pandemic, um, many churches didn't meet and took a long time to, to get uh, back to meeting in person again. And um, the church here, out of their love for God's word and their love for one another, um, uh, very quickly wanted to meet together. And what a blessing for a pastor to have a congregation that wants to be together and to learn from God's word. And so that's been an encouragement. We are the Ship family, uh, Stephen, Sarah, uh, Joseph, Isaiah, and Nora. And I'm Daniel. Daniel, Oliver, and Maggie. Yeah. I, I had the blessing of growing up in an RP church, and we both were mentored um, in college at an RP church, and so this was just, um, we, we love the RP church anyway, but this particular congregation we never had the pleasure of worshiping with or knowing, and so when we visited, just the warmth of the greeting and how quickly we were um, just uh, enveloped in the congregation here was, was a blessing. Well, I let the children chime in. I think certainly yeah. one of the things that stands out to me is what Sarah said, which is the, the warmth of the church. And kind of combined with that, it's, it's a warmth yeah. that's not... Um, the product of everybody being exactly the same. You have people from different walks of life, different ages, different backgrounds, and um, and yet there is a common unity in Christ, and um, and so that, that makes it a really special place. So one of my favorite things about the church is the pastors and how encouraging they are, and yeah. how they faithfully preach from the Word each each week and. I can't count all the times where I've been just blessed and encouraged Same. by their s sermons. But also, I've had the privilege of getting to know them more personally. Almost every week, I either talk to one of either Pastor McCollum or Pastor Holdeman. And then I'm even working in a, through a book with Pastor McCollum. So it's been great to just have the opportunity to get close to my pastors and know them and be able to come to them with anything, pretty much. One of the things that I think struck me, first of all, and something I really love is just the singing and how it's all, it's focused on the Word of God, really, but then it's just at the same time beautiful in a way that's also unique because most churches, they have more instruments and we do it a cappella with just our voices being lifted to God and I think that's really special. I've been in our youth group since like sixth grade or something, it starts around then. But I think it's just really fun because like at our youth group is a mixture of like a Bible study and being able to just like have fun and games. So there's like a fun mix where you are just being kids together and growing up and having fun, but also studying the Word of God. And yeah, I think Pastor Holderman is there most every week to just talk about the Word with us. So. Great. As a parent, I've been impressed with uh, whether it be in youth group or just what I see on Sunday mornings, the way the youth of different ages are mixing together. Um, I think it's often the case that youth maybe are siloed one with one another from the rest of the adults, or even within the youth, they're kind of siloed by grade. And I don't find either one to be the case here. You get a lot of um, mixing of children of different ages, and then children, of course, are with parents and worship. and. Um, so yeah, there's a youth group, but it's, um, it's just been a really uh, healthy dynamic and clearly a blessing for my children. We recently had our VBS, and I love that a church that is our size can run a VBS, and it's very humble but beautiful. Uh, I love that you have all of the kids attending, and then when they age out of that, the very next year they're there volunteering. And so everybody is involved at some le level, either receiving the teaching or investing in the next generation, and that's, that's really beautiful. So. I'm Eric Cousins, and uh, this is my wife, Rachel, and three, three of our seven kids, Liberty and Elizabeth and Grace. And uh, we've been here at the Bloomington RP Church since uh, the winter of 1998. 
One of the things about Reformed Presbyterianism that we've always appreciated is the kids learning the Psalms, to sing the Psalms, so they wander around the house singing scripture, which is great. It's, it really has been a blessing to grow up singing the Psalms, um, just cause, like I've been doing it my whole life a lot of times when I'm doing something, like a psalm just like pops into my head from like this situation, or like you'll be like be reading them like in your Bible and like the tune just like comes into your head. And it's, I don't know, it keeps your focus, I think, on God. Uh, just having a solid church to raise your, your kids in is key, um, especially in our day. It's a very welcoming congregation and uh, I would say friendly. There's a lot of fellowship that goes on uh, before and after the service. Uh, that's pretty key. And of course, the solid preaching from God's Word, uh, the whole counsel of God, not just the parts that we might like, but um, going through books methodically. Um, and the, doctr the topical doctrinal studies on occasion as well. You know, I've thought about how we look at this blue banner week after week for Christ's crown and covenant. and. You know, after a number of years of thinking about that, you start to realize some of the richness of that, that we have Christ as our King. That makes all the difference in our lives. And He's He's a King who's for our good, you know, and a conquering King. And we sing a lot about that in the Psalms, Psalm 2 or Psalm 110. So what a blessing to have our kids growing up knowing the truth of the Gospel, that Jesus is King and that what He does and, and wills happens. My name is Jermaine Cochran. I am a member of the Bloomington RP Church. So what attracted me to the church is my husband. <laughs> so uh, we got married, we met in 2012. Uh, we got married in the Philippines and it took a year for me to get to the States. So what attracted me to the church was that this is the church she was going to. Um, I had visited it when we were still dating, and so I knew this was going to be the church we were going to go to. Now, I come from a church back home, which is like, at our height, we were like 5,000 strong. It was a Reformed Baptist church, but it was Reformed as well. But because it was 5,000 strong, you know, after the service or even before the service is done, people are like rushing out because they got to get to that restaurant before everybody else gets there, and so they have a spot, right? So. Um, but here, the norm is people stay, sometimes like for an hour, um, just talking to each other, which is wonderful. There's so many things that makes this church different and good, because uh, you can be different but not good, right? The fact that we have centuries of history in this town is a big deal, because I'm sure you know your Christian history, you know, you can have a church be strong for 20, 30 years and then it's gone, right? Um, but that we've been here 200 years is, is a big deal. So I'd say this church is very loving. We do families very well. Um, we are very committed to reform theology. Sing! Oh, we can sing your ears off. Um, a cappella too. Um, and uh, just really mature leadership. Yeah. As the congregation gathers to celebrate the milestone of its 200th anniversary, we marvel at the work of God among us. Jesus is fulfilling his promise in Matthew 16, 18 to build his church. Today we have a significant ministry to internationals through our English as a Second Language program. We host a Chinese-speaking congregation in our building, and we have an active youth group of nearly 30 young people. We host Bible studies, outreach efforts, prayer groups, and a discipleship program. We have been blessed to continue our ministry to the Indiana University community and rejoice at the number of students and families who have made us their church home while studying in Bloomington. We pray that by God's grace, we will be enabled to continue serving King Jesus for another 200 years or until the Lord returns, whichever comes first. Let's hear.